Welcome to Roundabout Oxford, a podcast from the University of Mississippi Libraries. A little backstory for our listeners. Our main campus is located in the city of Oxford in north central Mississippi. We are west of Tupelo, birthplace of Elvis Aaron Presley, and south of Memphis, the birthplace of Elvis, the king of rock and roll. Our region is renowned for its blues music, both hill country and delta. And if you drive due west, you might just happen across the infamous crossroads where, legend has it, Robert Johnson made a deal with the devil. Our main library has its own blues archive, which we'll be learning more about in today's podcast. Look out the window of the archive and you can spot the campus circle where segregationists rioted when James Meredith became the first black man enrolled at this university in 1962. The same riot that inspired Bob Dylan to write the song, Oxford Town. Today, on Roundabout Oxford, we'll explore music and musicians, past and present. Stay tuned. My name is Alex Watson. I am a research librarian at the uh, University of Mississippi Libraries, and I'm here with Greg Johnson. Greg, why don't you go ahead and give us your official title? My uh, official title is Blues Curator and Professor. All right. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about some of the music collections that are available in the uh, university archives for folks. So why don't you give us a quick five second elevator pitch on what the uh, what the blues collection is okay sure the uh, the blues archive is a collection of blues and blues related uh, materials in a variety of formats so we have a lot of um, sound recordings photographs posters books magazines you name it if it's uh, related to blues in some way uh, We'll uh, have a good chance of having it here in the Blues Archive. Uh, We opened to the public in 1984, shortly after B.B. King donated his personal record collection to the University of Mississippi. And uh, yeah, we've been going strong ever since. Fantastic. So one of the things that people have had on their minds a lot recently, Greg, is um, how to engage with... um, university and archives resources from a distance. It's almost like they don't want to be in close contact with each other for some reason. So (laughs) just starting with the Blues Collection, what are some fun things that somebody who is unable to come into the library could experience from the Blues Collection right now? Right now, some of the easiest things that people can access remotely are a number of blues posters and photographs and um, some interviews with some blues musicians that are available through eGrove, uh, the institutional repository for the University of Mississippi. One thing that's a bit problematic for folks trying to access material uh, online is that the majority of the audio in our collections is still copyright controlled and uh, we can't just put it up there for anyone to access. So uh, there are some collections, the uh, Matthew Joseph collection and the uh, North Mississippi uh, Music Project uh, that we have up that have a number of interviews with blues and uh, other musicians around North Mississippi and particularly in uh, Lafayette County. And those interviews, those are with actual blues musicians? Yes. Uh, One of these collections, the Matthew Joseph collection, uh, was done by an intern uh, who worked two summers uh, here with us in the Blues Archive, and he was doing his research on North Mississippi Hill Country Blues, so he went all over uh, the northern part of the state interviewing uh, various musicians um, from the Hill Country tradition, but also interviewing scholars and people that 
have done a lot of research about Hill Country Blues or have worked in uh, the music industry. So he did uh, all of these interviews uh, for us and got permissions from the artist uh, for us to be able to use all of those interviews however we see fit. Fantastic. When were these interviews done? I believe it was 2010 and 2011. So that means that uh, some of those blues artists are probably no longer with us. Uh, that is correct. Yeah, several, several folks in there have uh, passed away since he did those interviews. Okay. Well, if somebody was interested in um, listening to one of those interviews, is there a particular interview that you would suggest as a good starting point? You know, I guess it depends on, uh, on folks if what, what your main interests are. Yeah, if you're interested in Hill Country Blues, if you want to get a good overview of those, there are some interviews with people like uh, David Evans and Scott Beretta uh, that are in, in that collection that will give a good overview of the Hill Country Blues tradition and uh, some of the musical characteristics of, of this style and give you kind of a survey of the landscape. Uh, so you can, that might be a good starting point. And then uh, you can dive in and uh, listen to uh, some interviews with, with some of the different musicians. Cool. So since you're mentioning it, could you give us just a quick overview of what Hill Country Blues is and what makes it a distinct art form? Sure. The North Mississippi Hill Country Blues uh, sound is usually defined in opposition to uh, the Delta Blues sound. Um, not that they're uh, competing styles, but it's usually describing what it's not. Um, a lot of times when you're describing what blues music is, it's often based on a typically a 12 bar, uh, three chord uh, structure. And a lot of the hill country blues uh, it might be a typical 12 bar form, but it usually only a lot of times only has one chord. Um, so you'll have like sort of one tonality uh, that the whole key is the whole piece is uh, based in. And you're not really changing chords so much, but you're setting up a dance groove. Um, I think it was Jesse May Hemphill that called it the hypnotic boogie. It's, uh, huh. you know, a lot of times, uh, a lot of this is uh, one of the sort of key figures in the early development of the Hill Country Blues sound was Mississippi Fred McDowell. And um, yeah, he has a, some real driving rhythms in his uh, guitar playing. Um, a real rhythmic drive to it. Um, so that's, that's a sort of shortened definition. And this music was intended to be danced to. This would be the sort of thing that would play in uh, a juke joint or a place like that, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times, that's, that's another thing, yeah, this is, um, people who are kind of new to the blues, they often think that blues is sad, or always about loss. Uh, not the case. Um, Albert Murray, um, blues and jazz historian, he wrote a book, uh, Stomping the Blues, that really gets at this blues aesthetic, uh, talking about the act of performing blues is really a way of getting rid of the blues. So sometimes the songs that you're playing... They're not, you know, uh, tear in my beer, uh, shoegaze, sad uh, music. A lot of it is dance music. It's something uh, to relax and unwind to at the end of, uh, uh, you know, a long week of manual labor. Um, and, yeah, it is, and particularly a lot of the hill country blues is, it has such a strong rhythmic drive uh, that it's definitely dance music. Yeah, and you would hear it in uh, juke joints and clubs all over North Mississippi. Yeah, so music to chase the blues away, in other words. Absolutely. Um, just out of curiosity, Greg, um, was there much of a hill, uh, hill country music scene in and around Oxford, or was that something you tended to find a little bit further out? So a lot of the, uh, there are a couple, several places that are kind of key for uh, the hill country blues uh, traditions. So that's uh, the Holly Springs area. And um, sort of a Cenotopia south under, to around Como, the area right around uh, Como, Mississippi, Gravel Springs. Uh, so these are all areas that are not very far removed uh, from Oxford and uh, Lafayette County. In fact, I, I believe uh, R.L. Burnside, one of the major figures of the Hill Country Blues uh, tradition, was born pretty close to uh, College Hill, 
the College Hill community uh, here right outside Oxford. Oxford, we kind of find ourselves on the southern part of the uh, Hill Country region, and um, you know we're clearly we're outside the delta, but we're we're so close to that. So we we get a lot of influence from these two different sounds, uh, the Hill Country and the uh, the Delta Blues uh, to our west. So that's something that someone who's interested in can check out right now in E-Grove, uh, our institutional role repository. Yes, absolutely. There are a number of things that uh, people could find there. Um, certainly the Matthew Joseph, the uh, North Mississippi uh, Music Project that was started. Uh, was, this was a project that was, we had, um, I guess it was three years running. There were uh, three members from the Library of Congress Folklife Division, including the former uh, head of that division, Michael Taft. And they came down and conducted a field school uh, here at uh, the University of Mississippi um, for students in uh, Southern Studies, History, and Music. Uh, I guess it was open to anyone, but those were the main students who were involved in it. And they were teaching them a lot of conventions of uh, interview technique, basics of oral history, documentation. Anyway, each year the focus was on music in, uh, in Lafayette County. So the students would go out and interview musicians that practice and perform here in, uh, in the greater Oxford area, but also uh, people who uh, work in like church musicians, choir directors, organists, people that book music for live music venues here, DJs, and some scholars who have studied uh, the music in this area. And um, yeah, so I think that would be a, a useful resource for people wanting to find information about music here in uh, the greater Oxford area. Interesting. So it sounds like if you really wanted to, you could do a deep dive into the uh, musical heritage of this area from several different traditions and really sort of orient yourself in uh, what sounds like a crossroads here in Oxford. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and one thing that came out of this project, the uh, Field School for Cultural Documentation, uh, led by members of the Library of Congress, was us realizing that there was a real need to document and collect a lot more of what's happening uh, in the local music scenes here in the Oxford area. Uh, a few years ago, one of the Southern Studies classes uh, was doing a project on this very topic. And we realized that, yeah, we have, obviously we have a lot of materials related to blues, um, but we didn't have too much outside of that genre. So I've Last year, I started up something we're calling the, um, the uh, Oxford Local Music Project. And we kind of kicked this off with um, the Kudzu Kings, a local band who celebrated their 25th anniversary uh, at a show at the Lyric Theater uh, last fall. So in conjunction with that, uh, members of the band donated a lot of materials um, to the Blues Archive. Uh, so a lot of... Uh, recordings, audio recordings of shows they've done uh, documenting their 25-year uh, career together, photographs, posters, artwork, um, and uh, some video as well. So we're currently getting all of the metadata prepared for that collection now. This, this is going to be another collection that will go up into uh, eGrove uh, when we get that uh, complete. Um, but that we use sort of as a launching pad. Uh, I put out a uh, call in the, um, the local voice, uh, local newspaper here last fall, uh, coinciding with that Kudzu King show. And I was asking folks for uh, any information, you know, if they have sound recordings of uh, live shows of different bands uh, from Oxford, if you have photos, posters, um, you name it, let us know. We, we want to collect this stuff so that folks can get a really good sense of who has played here in Oxford, uh, some of the bands that have come and gone over time uh, here. So we're talking anything like country, rock, punk, metal, whatever it is, um, classical music traditions, jazz. And uh, so we're really trying to go 
pretty broad with uh, collecting this. And I've gotten some good responses. Uh, I've got a great collection of general um, music posters and flyers that someone donated to us, several uh, recordings from different bands uh, here in, in Oxford. So, yeah, we're working on that. That's, gonna, that's coming down the pike, though. It's not, not up and available online just yet. Fantastic. So if somebody had a, a piece of Oxford or the surrounding area's musical history that they were interested in sharing, they might be able to get into contact with you in the future to uh, arrange to have that shared? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they can, anybody can just, uh, you know, find the, the Blues Archive uh, online and just all my contact information is there. And I would love to talk to you. Fantastic. Well, Greg, is there anything else in the Blues Archive or in the wider archives itself that, in addition to what you've told us about, that somebody might be able to access online right now for a little bit of musical relief? Sure. Yeah, let me um, focus, tell you a little bit about some of the non-Blues collections, uh, music collections that are, that are online and available to the public. One, uh, another collection that documents uh, tradition uh, is the uh, shape note singing uh, tradition. This is a, a sort of a music school tradition where people were taught uh, a, a sort of solfege based on, that would correspond with the note heads on, a, on sheet music as you're reading it. They would have different symbols rather than just the typical dot that we see in printed music. You'd have dots, you'd have diamonds and squares. And those corresponded with these solfege uh, symbols that were used to help people uh, learn how to sight sing uh, music. So, and these were all, this is a religious music uh, tradition. And there was a folklorist who taught at um, Memphis State, uh, before it became the University of, Mem uh, of Memphis, uh, John Quincy Wolf Jr. And uh, he documented, he recorded a lot of shape note singings all throughout the South, uh, around Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Anyway, uh, I digitized 50-something uh, cassettes of his that were donated to us a number of years ago, and those are available on eGrove. Let's see, some other um, collections. Oh, yeah, we have um, some really interesting materials that are quite far removed uh, from our base collections uh, on one level, but n not necessarily when you really start uh, delving down into uh, uh, history of music. Uh, and those are in the uh, Kenneth Goldstein collection. Dr. Goldstein was the first professor of folklore at the University of Pennsylvania. And he, uh, he did a lot of the uh, first recordings of um, Reverend Gary Davis, did a lot of early recordings, I believe, of uh, Sonny Terry, Bronnie McGee, a number of blues artists. He did um, some of the earliest recordings for um, Bluesville, Prestige, Stinson, some of these, these labels in the uh, 1950s, sort of in this transition period uh, as we're transitioning from 78 RPM recordings into, into LPs and uh, vinyl. Anyway, he uh, he's sometimes credited as one of the guys that really started writing uh, and treating liner notes seriously for folk, uh, folk music, uh, including blues and, and other traditions. Uh, anyway, he, um, he also was very interested in Anglo-Celtic origins of a lot of American folk music, and he recorded a lot, did a lot of field recordings in uh, New England, uh, up into Canada, particularly um, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, and in Scotland. And we've digitized probably yeah, close to 2,000 audio cassettes and open reel audio tapes uh, from his collection over the years. And you can access the audio reels, the audio from those in eGrove uh, if you find the Kenneth Goldstein collection. And you can hear a lot of uh, different uh, folk music traditions from Canada, uh, the US, Ireland, Scotland. So a lot of uh, dance music, fiddle tunes, lectures on folklore uh, and different folk customs in these collections. Um, so if you're into that, those types of music, uh, you might find something really interesting. 
Well, Greg, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to us. Thank you very much, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate your time greatly. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. Administrator, and I am a library manager at the Idea Lab at the University of Mississippi Libraries. My name is Selim Girai. I'm the director of orchestral studies at University of Mississippi. I conduct the Lafayette Oxford University uh, Symphony Orchestra, uh, as well as teach conducting, uh, teach uh, the violin and uh, string related courses. So, a little backstory. We first met when you came into the Idea Lab, which is a makerspace in the basement of the university library. And pretty much we have a lot of equipment in there that allows people to do hands-on learning activities and uh, complete projects where they might need specific tools like 3D printers, sewing machines, uh, soldering irons. In particular, you actually reached out to us because you needed access to a soldering iron and some instruction, correct? That is correct. Uh, at that point, I was working on an LED light project, and I had a small soldering iron, uh, but did not feel comfortable using it, and I did not feel comfortable uh, with the technology of LED lights. So that's when I uh, reached out to, to you. Yes, and I think you were able to work with one of our student workers to kind of learn some, he was really great at soldering tips. He'd been soldering since like as a child. <laughs> so I know he, uh, he was really great about um, being able to share his knowledge about um, electrical projects and, and soldering. But can you talk to us a little bit about that project that you were working on? Um, now you're a violinist and you are the director of orchestral studies. So what exactly was this project? So the project was for um, actually two stand lights that I needed. Uh, I needed a regular stand light and I needed a conducting stand light. The stand light that I was using as a violinist was a generic music stand uh, with an incandescent light bulb uh, with its limitations. And uh, knowing about the new LED technology, I thought that could be improved upon. So that was my goal to come up with a stand light that could give me better lighting um, in, in a pit, or it could be uh, better lighting in less than perfect, perfectly lit um, performance area. Uh, and the other project that I had, which was uh, a conductor's light, which I came up with the uh, materials that I could build the box, so to speak, and then make it reflective, and then put in the lights in it, and then do the soldering. Uh, my initial project was the instrumental stand light because it was a little smaller and it was a little less complicated, I thought, but I thought I would just go and go for both projects and purchase some LED lights and uh, some other items and uh, came out to the library and your student helped me with, with those projects. Now you fabricated that entire lamp from what I remember, like even the base of it, everything, all the components were either kind of like scavenged materials or they were materials that you know you purchased and you put together you know it's not like you went out and bought like the major components of a lamp you fabricated the entire can you talk to us a little bit about like the process you went through sure um so let me talk about two different lamps the smaller instrumental 
a regular music stand lamp. It is the lamp that is used uh, or light, uh, lighting equipment used by um, concert halls around the country and around the globe. Uh, so that is uh, a standard item, but it comes with a long incandescent light bulb, which is rather dim and turning 50, turns out my vision is not the same. So uh, I found myself needing more and more light. So in that case, I simply uh, gutted the lamp itself. Uh, so the, the base and the light bulb came out. So that left me with the um, metal base of the lamp and its clamp. Um, so I didn't have to do anything with the base of it. All I had to do was get rid of all the electricals so I could start from scratch again. And uh, not having worked with LED lights, um, I did not have any um, confidence I could accomplish this on my own and be safe. That's why I came um, to the idea lab and, and, and worked on it with, with your student. I've always been interested in making things, um, whether it is taking a clock apart and seeing all the gears and see how that works and then be able to put it back together. Um, initially, I wanted to become a, a violin maker. Um, so, I always had that um, interest and still do. Um, and currently, for instance, uh, the Oxford String Project for which I'm responsible, uh, we have instruments, over 80 instruments that we have to keep up with. So there's regular maintenance, but there's also small um, repairs that can be done. And I feel comfortable attempting those. So that is, knowing that it's going to help students uh, that they have uh, instruments that are in working condition. So that's, to me, that's uh, worthwhile to try to improve your skills in helping those students. Mm -hmm. But if there are projects that are well above um, and beyond my, my means, um, whether it is my skills or tools, I feel perfectly comfortable taking those to, to a professional. What's, what's challenging about working on like a musical instrument that needs to be repaired? The challenge is, first of all, the repair needs to hold up. Uh, secondly, uh, instrument needs to remain within playable measurements. So there is the, what they call shop adjustment. Uh, so the height of strings or uh, placement of the bridge or any other uh, maintenance uh, that needs to be done. So that has to be done, first of all. But when it comes to small issues with the instrument or with the bow, it is possible to, to address those without, I don't want to say only specialized tools, but also specialized people. So, um, so I think it has to be a small enough um, project for us to feel comfortable uh, doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are books on, on instrument maintenance um, and what can be done by teachers versus but what needs to be left to professionals. Um, and I feel we're able to maintain those instruments uh, in a way that they are going to serve our students. We've had conversations about this before, about crafting and making and inventing. It's all about solving a, solving a problem. And then there's additional problems that have to be solved throughout the process. So do you have any thoughts on kind of like why hands-on learning and hands-on skills are kind of still important in a digital world? Like, you know, it, it seems like some of this, some of these crafts come and go, right. but then they come around again. To, to me, what's really interesting is how the material is going to act or react to what you're trying to accomplish. 
Um, so that's one part of learning process. Uh, so finding the right tool to do the clean enough um, uh, job so it, it doesn't look jagged mm -hmm. um, or it, it doesn't crack or break. So that's one thing I, I think about. The other thing is when you say, well, I'm going to make a stand light. So that's my project. So you start thinking about the project and then try to address certain problems that, that you could possibly foresee. Start working on it before you pick up uh, any tools, planning what you believe needs to be done. And then sometimes you find yourself reassessing the situation and you have to do something different um, to, to see through to the end of the project. Or sometimes it's not even possible and then you say, well, maybe I should abandon it at this point and then maybe come back and visit again later on. Are there any projects that you're working on right now or maybe just projects in the back of your mind that are kind of like your, you know, you're like your bucket list projects, you know, oh, something my. that you kind of hope and dream to be able to come up with at some point? I don't know. Sometimes actually as much fun as it is to come up with something new, um, sometimes it's, it's just as, as exciting to, to get to, fix um, a piece of furniture maybe uh, that that you like but it has some issues. It's interesting you're bringing up the, the fixing because I guess one of the most interesting ideas I've really come across with maker spaces and a lot of maker spaces do um, really try to promote sustainability um, and fixing rather than buying constantly and True. for for us I know a lot of people a lot of students, especially young students who've come in that the main reason they want to learn how to sew isn't because they want to like start doing fashion design. It's because they want to fix the clothing they already have because, you know, we have a situation here where so much, so many clothes are kind of like disposable. They're not really made for long term. And you're starting to see that more with furniture being made as well, that it's, it's not really being made to pan down to the next generation it's really being made to, okay, after a couple of years, you get tired of it. Well, talk about problem solving that, you know, we all had to become. <laughs> yeah, the masks, yes. The masks. Um, so we, we all have to step up um, and, and do something because let's say you cannot find what you're looking for. You either have to make it or you have to fashion some sort of a solution. Um, so you can continue, you can go on. And to me, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, projects, uh, when it comes to function versus beauty, um, I, I just find that the, the, the line really is blurry for me. I'd, I'd like for it to be functional, but to me, you know, artwork is, is just as functional as a piece of furniture because um, it, it does serve a purpose. You know, you'd brought up the, the fact that, you know, you showed me your, your mask for COVID-19 protection and you're right. Like there is a lot, I think this pandemic has actually made a lot of people kind of force them into learning some new skills very quickly or people being able to step up and help out. Like I know a lot of, um, makers across the country have been making, you know, PPE protective equipment for hospitals and um, people are at home trying to make masks out of t-shirts and whatever they have available to them. Um, and I don't think anybody of this generation, several generations have ever really been put into that sort of situation before. Um, so uh, yeah, like I, I think, you know, that's kind of going along with like the whole like, trying to promote people to learn new skills before you find out you have to have them. True. True. If you have a, a 3d printer, uh, this is the time to, uh, get to use it and, and put it to good use actually. And seeing some makers do that, uh, I think that's, uh, inspirational. I hope that we'll get to come back to idea lab and get to do new projects. 
that's that's my goal and get to do things that are not you know mask related or <laughs> it's just it's true it's for fun you know, learning how to learning how to instruct people as well as people maker spaces are very community based and so i think it is a challenge for a lot of people to be in isolation as long as they are wanting to maybe work alongside other people and you know one of the other things that that i find uh there are parallels to uh to my profession with uh, this as a hobby uh is getting to improve yourself um so if i, I can improve my skills uh, and gain a new skill set to uh, attempt a project that I wouldn't um, with my current skills. I think that is that is to me what's exciting. Um, that's what I was able to do uh, with this LED light project. So I'd like for that to continue. So next time I'd like to challenge myself with something else. But without the Idea Lab, I couldn't. Well, really appreciated talking with you today, Salim. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. My name is Abby Norris. I am the Digital Initiatives Librarian at the University of Mississippi J.D. Williams Library. It is May 29th, 2020, and I am here interviewing Alex Woodson. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us your title? Sure. Um, my name is Alex Watson, and I am a Research and Instruction Librarian and Associate Professor with the uh, J.D. Williams Library at the University of Mississippi. And we are here today to talk about sheet music collections. So to start, can you tell me how you became interested in sheet music databases? Well, one of the things that I am extremely interested in, just for my own sake, as well as helping others, is information in the public domain. And uh, one of the most interesting things is sheet music, recorded music, things like that. Because for a long time, the public domain was sort of paused in the early 1920s, just at the dawn of what we would consider to be the modern era of recording and sheet music uh, and things like that. So for many years, the only things that were available in the public domain along those lines were um, from that early era of music and recording. And it was a huge explosion at that time. It's probably comparable to um, the explosion in vinyl records in the 1960s, or um, what's going on right now with digital files. There was a huge proliferation of people offering a huge proliferation of products. Competition was high, lots of people were entering the marketplace because at the time, if you think about it, it was before radio really had a hold, long before television, and having a piano in the parlor or even a piano that was accessible to play in a public space was one of the primary methods of recreation that people had. So by having new and interesting sheet music, it was essentially the equivalent of going out and buying a new DVD or um, a new CD uh, or downloading a new file at those times. So as soon as you start looking into things that are available in the public domain around the turn of the 1920s and before, you immediately start getting into sheet music. If you ever went into a video store in the 1980s, you probably would have noticed that the covers were just an explosion of color and all sorts of really eye-catching graphic designs. It's because that was the dawn of home video and they were trying to appeal to people who were browsing. You were browsing videos and you wanted to reach out and grab somebody with a very eye-catching thing. Even if the movie was no good, even if it was a low-budget dubbed import from Hong Kong, uh, eye-catching cover could go a long way. And it was the same thing in the 1920s. You had these pieces of sheet music that um, within just the space of 20 years from the beginnings of sheet music as we know it in the 1880s and 1890s through to the 1920s, 
there was an explosion in really eye-catching graphic designs for the covers of these sheet music because they would usually be just a couple leaves of uh, paper that were stapled or glued together. But by having a really eye-catching, pleasingly graphically designed cover, they could stand out on the shelf and attract people to come and buy them. So even if sheet music isn't your thing, even if you're not musically inclined, even if you're not able to play the music, there's often a huge amount of public domain imagery associated with these that's useful for a wide uh, variety of purposes. And why do you think the historic value of this sheet music persists? And why do you think it's important that these music collections are digitized and made available to the public today? Well, it is basically a slice of what the popular culture was at the time. Uh, most of the collections that I'm talking about start in the 1880s and go through the mid-1920s. I believe we're up to about 1924 when it comes to things entering the public domain. And so what that gives us is a snapshot, um, a moment fossilized in amber about what the most popular songs were for people at that time. Admittedly, you have to add some caveats. The most popular songs for people that could afford to buy sheet music. The most popular songs for people that were able to play sheet music. There were certainly other songs that were popular at the time that were never recorded for a variety of purposes. And there are definitely other ways to engage with those, like in the uh, University of Mississippi archives, with oral histories and things like that. But when you're thinking about um, American mass culture, these really show a lot of the things that were prevalent in that time for better or in many cases for worse. And if people are interested in finding this sheet music, what are some of your favorite databases to see these historic collections? Well, first up, I definitely need to put in a pitch for the Sheldon Harris collection at the University of Mississippi. We have that in eGrove in our um, institutional repository. And what they've done is they've gone through a lot of the sheet music that is owned by the university archives and they have digitized it in PDF form. So that means that you will get the um, cover image, which as I said, is often very eye catching and um, well done. You'll get all of the interior music. It's done in a very standard format that should be familiar to anyone who's ever uh, played piano or had piano lessons along with the lyrics. And uh, the lyrics are usually done sort of uh, hymnal style, I would say, with the individual syllables broken up as you're intended to sing them. And uh, it's extremely easy to search and find things in there and download them. But um, this, I think, is a good time, though, to mention this is very clearly displayed on the front page of the Sheldon Harris collection, but it's something that really bears noting. Um, the music of the time was incredibly virulently racist. You had a lot of minstrel songs and the sorts of things that are really shocking to modern sensibilities. And so if you are going to be looking through sheet music that is available in the public domain, this is something that you have to be prepared for. When I'm looking through it, I wind up sort of developing a visual filter. I'll be looking through it in different songs and I will just sort of glance over something. And if I see any sort of coded words or uh, imagery, I'll just skip right over it and ignore it. But it's also the sort of thing that demands a little bit of a high tolerance for that sort of thing. It was a different time. That's what the popular culture was at the time. It shouldn't have been that, but it was. And that's definitely something that you need to uh, keep an eye out for. And I, to be fair, eGrove does have a disclaimer upfront and bold that um, we don't endorse that. Uh, we're preserving it for historical purposes only and basically saying this is how it was and it wasn't cool. So these collections might be something you don't go looking for just a song that you're going to learn to play on a piano. It really is about preserving the cultural heritage of that moment. Well, it is, but you certainly can use it to go find a song that you'd like to play on the piano. There's, there's nothing keeping you from doing that. And some of these songs are actually quite nice. Um, but there's no way to go in looking for a nice song to play without being exposed to the historic culture. Um, you can't have one without the other. They're 
inexorably linked. Even if you are looking for a innocuous, non-racist song, you're going to have to flip through um, some really horrible stuff. So if you are, would like to use it for pleasure, that's wonderful. I would definitely say that would be fine, but you just need to keep that in mind as you're doing it. As we've explored throughout this episode, Mississippi has a really deep and rich musical history. Are there other places in the state that have Mississippi music collections? Well, I, um, with all due respect to the University of Mississippi, the best sheet music archive in the state is the Charles Templeton sheet music collection at uh, Mississippi State. Admittedly, they don't have the same disclaimer that we do up front, which is a little bit problematic, but they have 15,000 pieces of digitized sheet music done to an incredibly high standard. Um, the images are sharp, they're crisp, they've been post-processed. Um, they are really one of my go-to places for finding these things. And then uh, the Templeton Collection is actually part of something that UCLA does called the Sheet Music Consortium. Um, which is a sort of consolidated search engine that allows you to search multiple sheet music places at once. So by entering in a simple query there, you can um, find search music across Mississippi State, UCLA, Baylor has a lot, Indiana. There are a lot of different places that have collections like this that have been put online. Now the quality varies the readability, legibility, and size and quality of the images vary. But if you're just interested in, hey, I'd like to sing a song about the moon, that's an excellent place to go. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the Mutopia Project, M-U-T-O-P-I-A. Um, it sounds like it's an episode of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but it's actually a um, open source collection of public domain sheet music that, um, has been released either, as I said, in the public domain or under Creative Commons license in PDF form, but also uniquely it allows you to have uh, MIDI files, which is great if you want to sing along to the music, but you don't have the ability to play the piano. And it also has um, things in Lillipond file, which is a uh, music editing format that you can use for uh, multi-tracking. So you mentioned Mutopia, and one of the things I love about libraries is that they are rapidly expanding their digital resources, and really libraries are pioneers in providing public access to innovative software. So can you tell us a little bit more about Mutopia and how people who are interested in it might go about using it? Uh, sure. It uses just a very basic search interface as well as... Um, you can search by a specific instrument, a specific composer, a specific style. They've got a lot of classical music, as you might imagine, since that's in the public domain. But I think that the strength of that project and something that we in the uh, library world can learn from is that they have started offering the music in um, additional ways, MIDI and Lily Pond especially. Um, for those who don't know, MIDI is just a standard music format that allows you to play a standard music file using synthesized instruments on your computer. So having a MIDI file available along with a piece of sheet music is an extra level of interactivity. It sort of helps bring that past work to life in a way that simply reading the sheet music doesn't. And it's especially noteworthy that it allows you to listen to the music even if you're incapable of playing it yourself. There are a lot of different ways that you can take a piece of sheet music and put it into mini format, but most of them are heavy duty commercial types of software that are extremely expensive. So one of the opportunities that I see for libraries to step up in this regard is uh, if the library purchases access to an editing tool and uses that to create MIDI files for the sheet music in its collection and then makes those MIDI files available, then people can listen to the music in addition to simply looking at it. And if you're able to um, provide it in a editable file format like um, the Lily Pond that I just mentioned, that gives your users the opportunity not only to interact with and experience the music, but to innovate with it 
and remix. Because remix culture is one of the things that I am the most interested in. And when it comes to sheet music, most of the things that I wind up using and remixing are the covers, which have terrific graphic design elements. It's very easy to take one, not one of the racist ones, and make it into something that is very eye-catching from a modern perspective in terms of a piece of graphic art or graphic design. But if libraries were able to make the recordings themselves available in a way that's easy for people to edit, either a MIDI or a lily pond or something else, then that would allow people an additional way of engaging with this uh, music. And I can even see ways that people might be able to really engage with some of the really problematic elements. Taking an incredibly virulently racist song and remixing it into something that parodies those outmoded views comes to mind. Um, there's definitely some interesting things that you can do with that. And libraries have a unique opportunity because in many cases, we may have the only surviving copy or the only surviving copy in a library. And as time goes on, more and more music is going to fall into the public domain now that that uh, pause button has gone away. So in 10 years, in 20 years, we will have the opportunity to be, to be doing this with um, some of the really uh, interesting jazz that was coming out in the 1930s and things like that. Thank you very much. And thank you for the conversation about different ways to engage with sheet music. And I really hope that this has encouraged people to look at it as so much more than notes on a page. So thank you for your time. Happy to help. Roundabout Oxford was developed and produced by Brian Corrigan, Alan Munchauer, Abigail Norris, Christina Streeter, and Alex Watson with help from Gail Herrera. We would like to thank our listeners as well as our guests Salim Garai and Greg Johnson. For more information on these guests and topics related to this episode, please visit our website at libraries.omis.edu.